This is Ross Feinwald on the Taiwan Hashtag Program, coming to you from Taipei, Taiwan, hosted by Storm Media. Today we're joined by a very special guest, Ambassador Dale Jie, Jie Wenji, who is a foreign policy advisor and China policy advisor to the presidential campaign of the Kuomintang candidate, Kaohsiung Mayor Han Guoyu. Ambassador Jie has served worldwide for the government of Taiwan in locations such as Brussels, Geneva, and Washington, D.C., and at the end of his long career in the Foreign Service, he was the representative to New Zealand. Ambassador Jay, welcome mm. to the show. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Ross. Let's talk about the yeah. state of the presidential campaign. We're a little more than two weeks from Election Day. Where do things stand? Because the polls show a very large gap between President Tsai Ing-wen and Hong Goyu. I think we should totally ignore the poll because I think all the poll has lost their uh, credibility. And since Han Guoyi announced uh, uh, that uh, he told his uh, supporter not to answer those polls uh, call seriously. So I think uh, it's, it's no meaning talking about polls uh, at this moment. But uh, my personal observation on the sending, I think uh, Han is on the upper hand at this moment. But even before he mm -hmm. called on his mm -hmm. supporters not to answer those polls, he mm -hmm. was behind by a, a fairly large amount, 10, 12, 15 points. That's totally, uh, I think, uh, untrue. Because uh, uh, after Han won the mayor's election last year, his supporters still there. He, his support is still there. Uh, and uh, to my understanding, uh, he has gained more support from all parts of the society in the past uh, one year. So there's no reason uh, that he will be behind uh, uh, President Tsai uh, Ing-wen for 30, uh, even a more than 30%. It's totally unreasonable. Mm. Yeah. Well, the government is certainly mm. making an effort to paint Han as a pretty bad guy, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the Mandarin language media mm -hmm. calls it like uh, the, using the government machinery. Is that true? Is the government really doing that to, to make Han out to be a bad guy? Are they using all their available resources to say, you know, he's, he's not a good mayor, he's buying land uh, mm -hmm. with funny deals? Or is, is that a fair accusation against the government? It's totally unfair, of course. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite useful for DPP to use a negative campaign to demonize their, their opponents. Uh, so people are used to that. But uh, to most of people's surprise, they use such kind of uh, strength to demonize uh, Mayor Haim. I think uh, it has caused some uh, reverse effect because they uh, demonize uh, Haim uh, too much. So it really irritates a lot of rational voters in our society. So uh, last weekend I was in Kaohsiung. I talked to some of the people who uh, joined uh, supporting Haim's rally in Kaohsiung. They told me they just couldn't uh, stand anymore that uh, DBP used such a uh, low uh, you know, uh, tactic to demonize Haim. It's totally uh, unacceptable. So they s decided to uh, stand out and support Han. And yeah. speaking of demonizing Han, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. issue that he gets the most demonization <laughs> about might be his mm -hmm. China policy. So let's talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that. Uh, if Han is elected, he mm -hmm. says he would return to the 1992 consensus as a framework or a basis for relations mm -hmm. with China, which is the policy that existed under the former president, mm -hmm. Ma Ying-jeou, the Kuomintang. Mm -hmm. Is there a market for that in Taiwan? Or, or is that something Taiwan voters support as a basis for Taiwan-China relations? Yeah, I think, uh, except the young generations, I think uh, there's still a quite wide range support for a 92 consensus in our society. Because uh, we, uh, most of people are still rational, you know. And we think that uh, most of the people in Taiwan think to normalize or to bring uh, cross Taiwan straight relation back to stability, a, sta a, a stable uh, status is uh, one of the most important things for the future leader of Taiwan. So in, in, in Ma's uh, eight years reign, actually, he uh, adopted the 92 uh, consensus. 
uh, to serve as the base for uh, to develop or to uh, maintain a peaceful relationship across the Taiwan Strait. So at that time, uh, didn't, Ma didn't uh, sold out Taiwan. So why should uh, Han was sold out, will, will, will sell, will sell out Taiwan? It's uh, it's not it's not logical. So Han was born and raised in Taiwan. He's a uh, hundred percent Taiwanese, and uh, he said he's going to die and buried in this land, in this island. So of course he will uh, uh, adopt the best policy to serve the uh, long-term interests, long, not even long-term, short-term, mid-term interests of Taiwan, uh, which is uh, uh, 92 consensus. So let's look at this from mm -hmm. the other angle. What's mm -hmm. wrong, mm -hmm. in your view, mm -hmm. with President Tsai's China policy? Why is rejecting, and she's rejected the 92 consensus, why is that bad for Taiwan? I think the current state of Taiwan is a perfect illustration that why uh, President Tsai has chosen the wrong uh, route for Taiwan. And he chose to confront China, you know, mainland China which is uh, unwise because it's a globalized uh, world now. And 40% uh, of our expert uh, uh, goes to China. So China is our biggest uh, trading partner. Uh, no leader should, not, uh, should ignore such a fact. So maintain a uh, peaceful and stable or even constructive cross-trade relationship will serve the interests of the majority of the population in island. That's a basic, I think, uh, uh, rule for anyone who wants to handle such a uh, you know, complicated relationship. First, they have to bring stability back to the cross Taiwan Strait relation. First, whoever, who, no matter who, uh, suppose he or she cannot bring stability back to the Taiwan Strait, will not, you know, answer the call of the Taiwanese people. Well, yeah. uh, I'm sure President Tsai mm -hmm. and her team would say, yeah, 40% of exports from mm -hmm. Taiwan go to China, but we, we need to diversify that. So as you mm -hmm. know, uh, they've been trying to do that with their mm -hmm. southbound policy and yeah. uh, seeking trade agreements. Uh, you, know, you you've been involved in trade agreement yeah. negotiations. Can Taiwan get into the RCEP or the CPTPP, uh, even if China, they're in the RCEP, they're not in the CPTPP, but mm -hmm. they'll probably oppose Taiwan's entry. I mean, is this something that Taiwan could overcome if it continues the current, uh, you know, let's say President Tsai is reelected, so the current China policies continue. Can Taiwan join these trade agreements? Uh, if Taiwan is still under Tsai's uh, government, I think there's no chance. Uh, zero chance for Taiwan to join uh, both RCEP as well as CTPPP because uh, of course we will face uh, very strong resistance and objection from uh, obstruction from mainland China and given the uh, influence and scale of uh, China in the world of business in the world of economy in the world of trade uh, we have to realistic so suppose we want to join those uh, free trade uh, free trade arrangements, you know, regional trade arrangement. We first have to improve our relation with mainland China. That's the precondition, I think. Well, as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. the government also mm -hmm. says that relations with the United States are mm -hmm. better than ever. Now, in my many mm -hmm. years in Taiwan, mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident that mm -hmm. every government in Taiwan mm -hmm. says that mm -hmm. at the time, right? Yeah. Chen Shui-bian said it, mm -hmm. Ma ying -jou said it, right? So it's no surprise that Tsai Ing-wen uh -huh. and her government will say relations with the U.S. are better than they've ever been. Uh, political support, military sales. Uh, is it true? Are relations with the United States better today than they've ever been with, with Taiwan? I think uh, substantially, actually, uh, President Ma made more breakthrough in terms of relations with the United States. Because uh, in his eight years in government, actually, United States granted Taiwan visa-free status, which is a very substantial improvement. Um, if we talk about those resolutions or the uh, congressional opinions attached to the uh, 
the uh, those bills passed by the by the Congress, I think uh, there's about the they're about the same. You know, U.S. will always give Taiwan uh, uh, appropriate support, uh, sometimes verbal instead of substantial. You know, support uh, when the balance of power balance of power across Taiwan is strict tilted to the mainland side. So I think uh, DPP mistook U.S. You know, support to Taiwan as well as uh, to U.S. support to DPP, you know, which is a big mistake. I think has been, Taiwan has been a great uh, ally for, for, for U.S. for so many years. I think U.S. support to Taiwan has always been very consistent and stable. Uh, we decided on the status of cross-Taiwan state across Taiwan Strait relations. So in the past uh, probably three years, uh, probably our friends in Washington felt that the balance of power you know, began to tilt it to uh, mainland side more. So they gave more su support to Taiwan, which is very natural. And so those support is for Taiwan, not for DPP. So DPP should not you know, uh, exaggerate you know, those uh, support uh, from Washington, D.C. And what yeah. about other countries besides the U.S.? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, you said that the, we see parliamentary or congressional mm -hmm. statements of mm -hmm. support for Taiwan, mm -hmm. but, we, but we don't see Taiwan mm -hmm. overcoming that barrier to participate in international organizations like the World Health Assembly annual meeting or the International Civil A Aviation oh. Organization, Interpol. What, what, what is yeah. the, the issue there? You know, why, why, is the Guomindang approach going to be better to fix that, or is the DPP on the right path to addressing uh, Taiwan's international organization participation? Well, uh, I think uh, in, the f in, the, in the field of multilateral diplomacy, uh, DPP uh, three years uh, in, of, in government actually has uh, totally ruined our Taiwan's uh, opportunity to join the multilateral diplomacy uh, diplomatic arena. Uh, and uh, our uh, access to WHO, WHA, as well as ICAO has been denied, you know, since DPP took office, which is uh, very unfortunate. And they, they, they never tell the truth about why we've been denied uh, for uh, those organizations we used to be able to uh, join. Uh, it's because of the policy, I think. Uh, China policy. China policy. China's up. You know, when we talk about uh, foreign relations, we have to be pragmatic. If you are ideological, you're bound to pay for some price. And unfortunately, uh, DPP's uh, diplomacy tend to tilt it to uh, more ideological instead of, instead of being more practical. So naturally, uh, they face more difficulty uh, in joining international, especially governmental organization. To my information, even our participation in the international NGO has been uh, kind of uh, instructed more by the mainland sides. So I'm not saying we're going to, we have to bow to Beijing's pressure, but we have to have a way to deal with Beijing's uh, growing pressure. And, uh, if your ideal, your, your your mind, your mindset is too ideological, you know you cannot see, uh, you cannot be flexible, you cannot be practical. Of course, you have uh, much more uh, role to choose. Mm. But yeah. I mean, for the international organizations, mm. the mm. flexibility under the previous government was sometimes to accept uh, mm. uh, unusual names, Chinese mm -hmm. Taipei, yeah. uh, names like this, to attend or observer uh -huh. uh, to attend the international organizations. Is, is that maintaining Taiwan's dignity to do that? Is it an acceptable trade-off in order to attend? Or uh, is it better to be too ideological, like the DPP says, no, if we can't go a, a, as a full member with a proper name, we don't, we're not going to go? Uh, actually, I think DPP want to go to, uh, want to take any opportunity to participate in any kind of uh, activity uh, sponsored by any international governmental organization. In terms of uh, uh, names used by Taiwan, they are still very flexible. 
but uh, even those flexibility cannot uh, guarantee their successful, you know, accession into any uh, international organization. So I think uh, nomenclature issue is not an issue for DPP. The problem is their uh, global strategy, you know, for Taiwan. They choose to uh, be confrontational to one of the main, you know, obstructors for Taiwan's international participation, which is mainland China. And uh, so I personally believe uh, we should be able, we should choose a leader who are more capable uh, to manage a uh, pragmatic relationship with mainland China. Not like Chai Ing-wen, he's too confrontational, mm -hmm. which uh, leads to nowhere for Taiwan. Now you mentioned uh, uh, we, Taiwan shouldn't give in to Beijing's mm -hmm. pressure. What, what is China's role in, mm -hmm. in this election? Uh, are, are they spreading disinformation? Are, are, are people from China online uh, and writing comments in support of Han Guoyu? Is China influencing some of the media? Of course, not this media, uh, <laughs> not Storm, but, but other media. <laughs> is, is China doing that? Uh, do they have this impact on, on voter behavior? Well, I don't have any, uh, you know, uh, proof, direct proof that China is buying some India, uh, media, you know, or trying to influence some media. I don't have the direct proof, you know. So when you're at the Han campaign headquarters, just to be mm. clear, you don't mm. get a phone call from Beijing telling you what to do? Mm, no, no, no. Beijing, I think they have learned their lesson. You know, this is not the first time for a direct uh, popular vote for a president in Taiwan. They pay their price. They made the big mis they made serious mistake previously, you know, and they learned their lesson. So I think uh, they tend to uh, be more prepared for the one, you know, critical day, you know, happen across the Taiwan Strait, instead of being interfering, you know, uh, Taiwan's uh, presidential election, you know, directly, which will not serve their interest. And uh, uh, they understand very much. Suppose they have been caught, you know, that in supporting one of the party, you know, who's been campaigning for president in Taiwan, and they are, they are, they are killing that party. So suppose they've been, you know, caught, you know, uh, in supporting uh, KMT, I think they will guarantee KMT will have, will, will be, will be, will fail you know, for sure, in this election. But the government says this is happening all the time. That's why uh, they've proposed this anti-infiltration law, or the Fan Shan uh, is, is this law really necessary? Is, it, is this such a big problem? Because what you just said indicates mm -hmm. it's not as big a problem as the government makes it out to be. The goal, you just said, go me down, they're not taking instructions from Beijing. So is this anti-infiltration law necessary? Uh, I think it's part of uh, DPP's campaign. Uh, because uh, DPP, uh, still believe, you know, by bashing China, they will win more support. But I think uh, this tactic, you know, is uh, getting less and less effective. Because uh, I observe that our voter, our society has become more uh, rational and mature in terms of uh, facing threats from China, from mainland China. So, of course, it will work for some of the young generations in Taiwan. Still, after the Hong Kong, you know, incident, uh, DPP's uh, supporting rate, popularity, you know, has risen up uh, remarkably. So, of course, they will take advantage of this uh, uh, gift, you know, fallen from heaven, you know. So, so, so uh, I think uh, they will keep on doing that. But uh, it won't be that uh, effective. Mm. Let's try and uh, look a bit into the future, though. Mm. If the DPP wins the election, mm -hmm. what would be the state of China-Taiwan relations going forward? Well, there will be the state. Uh, I'll be wor I I'll worry quite a bit, and. Uh, I think the, the trade and economic relationship will, will decrease. Well, the ECFA trade mm. agreement expires in 2020. Uh, well, China can uh, kind of uh, end this agreement uh, 
unilaterally. You know, if you have agreement that has to be agreed by both sides, suppose one side wants to withdraw, you have no reason to keep them in this agreement. Mm -hmm. If you, they, be, they can be forced into, agree, into this agreement, it should not be called an agreement, right? So this is one part, that is one possibility. It will seriously uh, hurt Taiwan's uh, certain sectors of our economy, especially in the uh, machinery, in the cycling, and probably a textile industry. Yeah. So if Hong Yu wins, what would be the state of China-Taiwan relations? I think uh, no, no dramatic change, you know, no drastic change, but the, the relationship will be not that confrontational, you know, it will be more uh, pragmatic. And uh, I think the uh, exchanges between two governments will start to, you know, happen. Well, those have come to a complete halt, correct? Yes, yes. At this moment, it's totally complete halt, mm -hmm. yeah. But no peace agreement, he's not looking at, Hong is not proposing a peace agreement. Hong Kong said first you have to uh, have a majority consent in Taiwan society. It has to through a democratic process. It has to go through due process of law. He put a lot of preconditions uh, before this peace agreement can even put on the table. And I don't think uh, that's his priority. You know, you know, his priority is, is to save Taiwan's economy because people are, uh, are having bad times because of the, uh, the economic situation but now we're, we're having in Taiwan. So uh, his priority is to save Taiwan's economy and to make Taiwan more internationalized because uh, he says uh, the world is forgetting Taiwan. Mm. And at the same time, Taiwan is forgetting the world. Mm. So that is his, uh, what he thinks is the most important thing mm. he but should do. Speaking of that point, mm. you, know, you, you meet with foreign diplomats mm. and media. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they perceive Hong Guoyu? I think they are becoming more and more curious about Hong Guoyu. Who is this person? You know? And after uh, personal you know, encountering with Hong Guoyu, I think they uh, kind of uh, uh, a bit uh, surprised that he is such a learned as well as uh, pragmatic, as well as down-to-earth politician in Taiwan. And he is unconventional, but uh, he is a very leader-like leader. So I think their confidence to Taiwan, their uh, assessment, uh, their uh, their assessment as their confidence uh, to Han Guoyu is is growing so fast in the past few months, mm. and they are also the victim of those demonization of Han Guoyu by the uh, propaganda of uh, DPP, of course. But after you know direct and personal contact with Han. Uh, my observation is their impression to Taiwan, you know, change oh, uh, drastically, mm. yeah. And we have a few more minutes, so mm -hmm. just a, mm -hmm. as a final kind of discussion point, mm. in these last couple of weeks before the election, what, what mm. are the keys for either Tsai Ing-wen to win or Hong Guo Yu to win? I think uh, for both of them uh, to make uh, as few as mystic as possible. And uh, uh, for Han, a, uh, there are two major rallies, you know, one uh, in the coming Sunday in Taizong, which will be a very important indicator and stimulus to Han's you know, campaign. And the second one is the one day before the uh, voting day. And those two rallies will really you know, uh, have big impact, I think, for, for the both camp. And for, for, for uh, Tsai, I think he sh she should stop, you know, demonizing uh, Han, you know, because that tactic just uh, bring negative effect to her own campaign. You know, so uh, my prediction is uh, Han might uh, win the election uh, in a very big uh, 
a scale. Well, you know, yeah. we, we talked about yeah. our previous shows here yeah. that's, that a lot of media people in mm. Taiwan recently mm. have been making bets. So they say, you know, I'm going to give out 10,000 or 20,000 fried <laughs> chicken patties. You're, you want to make a bet like that? Yeah, of course, I, I'm a big supporter for Han myself. Mm. So I, I, I involve myself in a lot of his activities. And I have a lot of direct contact with his supporter. And I read a lot of uh, information about his campaign. So I'm very optimistic about his campaign. Because uh, I think that the, the, if you want to say what is the general atmosphere of this uh, society, Taiwanese society, before the uh, election, I said just one word, that is change. People want to see change. Suppose people want to see change. Who will benefit, the incumbent or the challenger? Of course, it's the challenger. So as a challenger, I think uh, Han has successfully created an atmosphere that uh, he is a uh, credible alternative, you know. And, uh, and given the economic, as uh, uh, social challenges that we're facing, people want to see change. So change will be the basic tune for this election. So we can easily predict who will be the winner. Easily predict and change mm -hmm. on January 11th? We'll mm -hmm. know in a couple of weeks. I've been joined today on Taiwan Hashtag mm -hmm. by Ambassador Dale Jie, a mm -hmm. foreign policy and China policy advisor to Kuomintang candidate Hong Kong. Ambassador Jie, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, for your invitation.